All right, let's give uh, problem three a try. And so problem three uh, is uh, problem 10.8, so problem eight from chapter 10 uh, in the text. <clears throat> so the table at the end of the problem statement is a set of VLE data for methanol and water at 333.15 Kelvin. Okay, so at 333.15 Kelvin, we're provided with a, um, a set of PXY data. And in A, we're asked, what is the saturation pressure of methanol um, at 333.15 Kelvin? Okay, so I'll take that. Uh, what's the uh, saturation pressure of, of pure methanol? Okay, so A, okay, so methanol is component one. Okay, so we're asked to solve for P1 sat. Okay, well, so if I look at my table, okay, so here's pure component two, here's pure component one. This is uh, my system that's uh, pure methanol uh, at pure component VLE. And so this would be P1 sat, all right? So P1 sat would just be 84.562, okay? And that's uh, kilopascals, okay? And since it looks like in B, I'll need to draw, you know, say sketch a phase diagram, okay? This is a PXY. Okay, so just to sketch what this would look like and what that point is, okay, here's my attempt at a PXY sketching on the pad. Okay, okay, so here's pure component one. Okay, I know pure component one, oh, that's really crooked. Pure component one is my most volatile component, and so it'll have the larger pure component vapor pressure. Okay, and you see that here, right? P1 sats 84.562, P1 sats, you know, obviously smaller, okay? So if I sketch my PXY, okay, there's my straight bubble line, there's my curved dew line, okay? And so this would correspond to P1 sat in which I were to transition directly from uh, vapor to liquid, okay? And over here, this would correspond to P2 sat. Okay, that'd be pure component two. Okay, so this is P1 sat, this is P2 sat up there. Okay, cool. Okay, so which brings us to B, okay. And B it says, what is the phase of uh, mixture that contains 50% um, by moles of uh, methanol at 333.15 Kelvin and 40 kilopascals, okay. So uh, the 333.15 Kelvin would essentially tell me uh, what PXY phase diagram I'm looking at, okay? Uh, and so let's take a look then, okay? So what I'm going to do, okay, is we're told our mixture is 50% by mole methanol, okay? And we're at 333.15 Kelvin, so that just tells me what PXY phase diagram I'm looking at. And so what I'm gonna do is, okay, so if I have a mixture of 0.5, ah, 0.5 mole frax of methanol, come on, <laughs> 0 0.5, okay, I'm going to draw a vertical line up, which would correspond to a line of constant composition, right? So my mixture has to, or my system has to be somewhere along this line, okay? The two points of interest would be, okay, so remember on a PXY, we have liquid up top here vapor on the bottom. Okay, so for this mixture, where I hit my bubble line, this would correspond to my bubble point. Okay, and at my bubble point, x1 is equal to z1. Okay, and then the other point of interest would be where I hit my dew line, okay, which would be right here. And this is where I'm going to see my sketch is pretty poor, right, because I ought to hit over here on my bubble line. Okay, but at my dew point, okay, y1 is equal to z1. Okay, so what I want to find is what are these two pressures, right? What is my dew point pressure and what is my bubble point pressure for that mixture? Because if my pressure, that 40 kilopascals, is before between those two values, then that means I must be in the two-phase region. Uh, if my pressure is above uh, P bubs, then I have a liquid. If my pressure is below P dew, then I have a vapor, All right? And uh, what are they asking for? They're, they're asking what the phase is, okay? So let's try and uh, guesstimate this. Chances are you would have to interpolate, okay? But if I'm first trying to find P bubs, okay, uh, so my bubble point pressure, right, at my bubble point of that mixture 
uh, x is equal to z. So I'm looking for when x is equal to 0.5. Okay? And so I find that it's going to be somewhere between here and here. Okay? So you would have to interpolate, okay? but you know, here you know, it's going to be somewhere between uh, 56 and 60 kilopascals. Okay? So we'll just say this is, you know, you should actually interpolate and say calculate the value, but you know, we'll see, maybe we don't even have to. So it's between 56 and 60 kilopascals. Okay. Now in the problem statement, we're told we have uh, 40 kilopascals, so we know we're definitely not in the liquid phase, right? We're below that pressure. Our pressure is lower than this, so we're either going to be in two phase or in vapor. Okay. So next, we want to find P do. Okay. So P do. Okay. So I'm looking for when y1 is z1 is 0.5, and I see I'm going to be between these two points, right? And so again, uh, you should, um, in theory, interpolate, right? If you want to find P. Okay, but I would find that P do will be between, uh, let's just say 20 and 39 kilopascals. Okay, so then it's clear that the pressure is going to be in between my bubble point and two point, so it must be in uh, the two phase region. Right, so B, right, must be in the two phase region. Okay, but just for completeness, so you can you know, make sense of all this, you ought to go and calculate the bubble point and dew point pressure uh, and get values, right, and then you know, show for yourself that it's, it's in between the two. Okay? But this is another example where uh, you know, in sketching my PXY, I can conceptually map out what I'm trying to calculate or why I need P bubs and P do uh, and what that would mean in the context of the problem. Okay, so that's B. C. At Z1 is 0.2, so I have a mixture of uh, 0.2 mole fracs. So I've met Z1 is 0.2 and 30 kilopascals. The system is present as two phases. What is the chemical potential of methanol and water in the vapor phase using an ideal gas reference state at 300 Kelvin and 101 kilopascals? Is the assumption of treating the vapor phase as an ideal gas appropriate? All right, there is definitely a lot going on here. But the first thing I want to look at is we're told that we have um, a system that's present in two phases. So I have two phase coexistence and our pressure is 30 kilopascals. Okay, and so what I'd like to do then is first, okay, I'm going to go to the table. So let me erase these lines that we had put up here. Oop, okay. So I'm going to go to the table, and ideally I'd want to find a pressure of 30 kilopascals, okay? 30 kilopascals is going to fall uh, in between these two points. And what I'd like to do then is I'd like to interpolate and calculate what, so if I were to, you know, interpolate to get, you know, a line at 30 kilopascals, so at 30, I'd like to know what x1 is and y1 is at 30 kilopascals, okay? And why I'm interested in Y1 at 30 kilopascals is, you know, we're asked what the chemical potential of methanol and water uh, are in the vapor phase, right? So my vapor phase would have a composition of, of Y1, right, if I'm reading into this correctly. Okay. All right. So that's going to be a, um, so the vapor phase, so I have a binary mixture at uh, 333.15 Kelvin and 30 kilopascals. So I know the temperature, pressure, and composition of that vapor phase, right? After I interpolate, I'll know the composition. And I want to calculate the chemical potential of that vapor phase, uh, essentially relative to an ideal gas at 300 Kelvin and 101 kilopascals, okay? Oh, an ideal gas reference state at 300 Kelvin and 101 kilopascals. Um, so we're not told uh, if this is mixture or pure component, okay? But I would assume, okay, this is a pure component, okay? And then we're asked is the assumption of treating the vapor phase as an ideal gas uh, appropriate? Um, and so it, it, this the problem is is really poorly worded in my opinion. But if I have a binary system. 
uh, at 30 kilopascals. As long as I don't have, uh, you know, vapor phase that contains, say, a carboxylic acid, a known component that's going to uh, self-associate, um, typically it would be pretty reasonable to assume that my vapor phase is uh, an ideal gas. Remember, atmospheric pressure is uh, 101 kilopascals, right? So, um, yeah, it seems reasonable the the pressures could be sufficiently low, so it would seem reasonable to treat the vapor phase as an ideal gas. Um, so. Yeah, okay, so we're well below um, atmospheric pressure, uh, and we don't necessarily have, um, you know, self-associating fluid, and so um, treating the vapor phase as an ideal gas would be a, a reasonable approximation, okay? So uh, we would interpolate to get the composition of my vapor phase, and then we know our vapor phase is at 30 kilopascals and 333.15 Kelvin. We'll take our vapor phase to be an ideal gas, and we want to calculate the chemical potential of each component in the ideal gas relative to, um, I'm going to say, pure component at 300 Kelvin and 101 kilopascals, um, also taken to be an ideal gas. Okay, so reference state is essentially just computing something relative to that state, um, which we take to be uh, zero. All right, this seems <laughs> this seems like uh, fun. Okay. Um, so let's give it a try, okay? So C, okay? So if I'm asked to calculate the chemical potential of a component in an ideal gas mixture, the first thing I'm thinking of is I'm thinking back to uh, chapter nine, okay? And what I'm thinking back to chapter nine is delta G of mixing, okay? So delta G of mixing, okay, for an ideal gas, we found a B, okay? Again, the key term to remember is sum over I, Okay, yi log yi, okay, molar or average of log yi, okay, and then there's going to be an rt in front of here because rt gives me the units of g, okay, and then sine is this negative or positive, well log yi, yi will always be less than 1 uh, for a mixture, so this term will be negative, delta g of mixing is always going to be a negative, so less than 0, so this is a a positive RT sum over I, y, YI, log YI. Okay, so for binary system, that, well, well, and actually let's, you know, stick with that, let's not write it out for binary system. Okay, and then our definition of delta G of mixing would be, so the molar Gibbs free energy of my ideal gas mixture relative to molar average of the pure component molar Gibbs free energies. Right? Yeah, so G of my ideal gas mixture minus sum over I, YI, GI. Okay, or equivalently, I could write this as, okay, GIG. Okay, so it's in general. This could be written as sum over I, YI, G bar I. Okay, the partial molar Gibbs free energy, the molar average of my partial molar Gibbs free energy of each component, minus sum over I, yi, gi, or just sum over I, yi, g bar I, minus gi. Okay, and again, I like this definition because it's the difference in my partial molar Gibbs free energy and my pure component molar Gibbs free energy. Okay, so in order for these two expressions to be consistent with each other, Right, um, we must have then that okay, and actually, you know, I could bring the RT in my sum. Okay, it must be the RT log yi is equal to g bar i minus gi, so that g bar i is equal to RT log yi plus. GI, okay, where my partial molar Gibbs free energy is by definition my chemical potential, okay, so this would be in, you know, I should put ideal gas signs up here, okay, because this is for the case of an ideal gas, okay, let me just put my ideal gas signs up here. So partial molar Gibbs free energy is equivalent to chemical potential. 
So mu i i g, okay, at say a given temperature, pressure, and composition is equal to R T log Y I plus G I, this would be my pure component molar Gibbs free energy at okay, this would be at the same T and P. Alright. So this is the quantity we're asked to calculate. Okay, the chemical potential of um, each component in uh, my vapor phase, where I know temperature, pressure, and um, uh, the composition. Okay, I know RT log YI because I know the composition, so that's fine. Okay, check, check. Okay, then the term I'm going to need to wrestle with is this guy. Okay, um, so this is the pure component molar Gibbs free energy at the same temperature and pressure. Okay, and so how we're going to have to work with this animal. Okay, so let's just say this is what I want to calculate. I have this first term. Okay, so what I'm going to focus on next is this. I need to calculate this. Okay, this is what I need to muscle out. Okay, so that's going to be my pure component molar Gibbs free energy. And we're told to adopt as a reference date, um, you know, an ideal gas at 300 Kelvin and 101 kilopascals. Okay, and so I'm going to take my reference date to be an ideal gas, a pure component ideal gas at this temperature and pressure, okay, which is different than um, my saturation pressure and, and the temperature of my system at saturation. Okay, all right, so uh, what am I going to do? Well, how I'm going to do this then, okay, let's see if I can get this right. So I want G ideal gas at T and P. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I am going to do my favorite mathematical trick of uh, adding zero to my expression. Okay, so if I want G ideal gas at T and P, I'm going to add a term G I G. Okay, I'm going to do naught. Okay, so add some T naught and P naught. Okay, minus G I G not at T naught and P naught. Okay, so essentially I'm just adding this term um, plus G naught minus um, G naught. Okay, so this would be molar Gibbs free energy of component I in an ideal gas state per component ideal gas um, at some you know reference temperature and pressure. Okay, so that if I were to rearrange then, okay, I'm going to write G I I G is equal to G I I G at T and P minus G I I G not at T not and P not okay plus G I G not uh, at T not and P not okay and in doing so what I'm going to do is we're told that we can uh, so we're going to adopt as um, a reference state a pure component um, system uh, at some T naught and P naught, right? So at uh, that temperature and pressure that we were given that are different than the temperature and pressure of our system at saturation. Um, and so if T naught and P naught, right, correspond to our, our reference state, that means that G I G naught is just equal to zero. Okay. So finally, if I need to get G I I G. Right, that's going to be G I I G at T and P minus G I G not at T not and P not. Okay, so again, right, this this might can seem you know a little different or a little odd, right? But all it is is right. If I were to bring this over, then the left hand side equals to the right hand side, right? And um, you know, I'm just defining, calculating absolute value um, by calculating things relative to reference state where my system or molar Gibbs free energy is uh, by definition zero. Okay, but I need to introduce the reference state because remember, thermo is just a field of differences, so there's really no such thing as absolute G that I can calculate. Right? Think back to chapter five; all we have are differential expressions. Um, uh, and so what I need to you know calculate is you know a difference. In G's, okay. Now it's going to make this animal difficult to uh, compute, 
is I have um, uh, systems at a different temperature and pressure. Okay, and so the first attempt I might take. Okay, so I think back to chapter five. DG is by definition negative SDT plus VDP. Okay, now if I were to use uh, our differential for dimensionless G, we'd run into the same problem. Right, and so the issue is. If I want to calculate the change in my molar Gibbs free energy between these two states, okay, I integrate the left hand side, I integrate the right hand side, okay. So now if I have an ideal gas, then integrating the second term, this VDP term, not a problem, right? Um, okay, the term that's problematic is, is this animal, okay. And then even that second term, right, the, the complication is that, well, yeah, I. I could integrate it, right? So in order to integrate this, I need to know how V changes with respect to P, okay? But challenge still is, is that my temperature is changing between those two um, states as well, okay? Um, and, but anyways, where I'm really stuck is integrating S, right? In order to integrate this term, I would need to know how S changes with respect to T, okay? And uh, that sounds complicated, okay? So well, actually, let me just write it down. So this doesn't seem like it's going to be a very fruitful uh, endeavor. Okay, and so uh, that doesn't seem good. Okay, so the next thing I might try is remember by definition G is equal to H minus TS. Okay, so uh, how can I use that? Well, um, so let's see, how do we want to say this? So we're taking as our um, reference state a uh, pure component um, at a, a given temperature and pressure, right? So G, IG should be equal to H, IG minus T, S, IG, okay? So now the question is, can I calculate H and S, okay? Well, so our... Um, Reference state is, you know, that ideal gas at T naught and P naught, and those I can get, right? So if I were to do the same sort of um, voodoo magic as up above, right, HI, ideal gas, okay, given our specified reference state would be, and actually let me write this down, HI, ideal gas at T and P, all right, I would compute as HI, IG, T and P relative to evaluate my standard state which I take to be my zero okay so I would just need to calculate this okay and to calculate that well for an ideal gas okay for an ideal gas um, you know dh ideal gas was just cpdt okay so beautiful okay so I could readily integrate this expression okay and since in the problem statement we're told that uh, heat capacity is constant, so I would just get the HI ideal gas is just CP component I uh, ideal gas uh, T minus T naught. Okay, so that term I can get. Then in terms of S, okay, so SI, okay, would be e so SI uh, ideal gas uh, at T and P would be SI ideal gas at T and P minus SI ideal gas naught at T naught and P naught. Okay, so this is my reference state, how I'm defining my zero. Okay, so for an ideal gas, DS ideal gas. Oh man, I'm gonna have to look back at uh, chapter five notes. Um, what is S? Um, I believe the first term is CP ideal gas over T dt minus, okay, I'm just going to, uh, yeah, uh, minus R over P dp, okay? Pretty sure it's a minus, okay? So when you're looking at your solution, uh, check the sign, okay? Check your sign, okay? But I believe it's CP over T dt minus R over P dp. Okay. Or, okay, CP ideal gas d log t minus r 
d log p. Okay, so okay, we're again we're told heat capacity is uh, constant, r is constant. So if I need this difference, I would just integrate from you know, my standard state to my state of interest. Okay, heat capacity is constant, so it'd just be a cp d log ratio of cp uh, log ratio of t's. Integrate this, I get a minus r log ratio of p's. All right, so I would get that si ideal gas is equal to okay um, cp ideal gas log t over t naught minus r log p over p naught. So I have an expression to get um, SI, right? I know my reference date uh, temperature. I know my temperature, it, reference date temperature and pressure. I know my temperature and pressure of uh, interest. We're given our um, constant pressure heat capacity. So I can get SI ideal gas. I can get HI ideal gas. And then once I have those, I could get GI ideal gas. Oop, okay. Don't mind my terrible writing so I can get uh, GI ideal gas if I have GI ideal gas then I can get mu I well so that's a pretty elaborate uh, animal right but I can get GI ideal gas um, pinning down that reference date um, and assuming the vapor phase is an ideal gas as well which again is reasonable uh, given our low pressure and so I could go and calculate uh, mu I then okay yeah, that was a that was a doozy, <laughs> but uh, there it goes. Okay, uh, key was assuming vapor phase is an ideal gas, and then when they tell us that reference state, we took it to be a pure component um, state. Okay, and assuming the vapor phase is an ideal gas is really reasonable. Okay, in general, if I have a vapor phase uh, that's around atmospheric pressure, ideal gas approximation is in general really good. Okay, um, where that's not going to be good if I'm at atmospheric pressure uh, would be if I have say acetic acid or carboxylic acid group which is known to self-associate in the vapor phase and then that'll cause um, deviations from that ideal gas behavior right because then I would have uh, molecules interacting with each other where in an ideal gas we assume that molecules don't interact okay um, and then you know one other thing to note is you know remember typically we're encountering um, vapor liquid coexistence or you know binary systems at coexistence near atmospheric pressure because uh, our columns typically operate near atmospheric uh, conditions or near atmospheric pressure why because pulling a vacuum or pressurizing my column would make things expensive right it's possible and you know, such as saying pressure swing um, but it certainly adds to the cost okay so cool that's problem three have at it